Deontay has officially left the building. You're going to see a very evil and sinister look come on her face as that entity has now. You can see the hate in the eyes of this demonic entity. Folks, this is not a joke. Millions of children, millions of young girls worship and idolize this demonic, satanic witch. She is nothing more than a, a, a child molester, as all Satanists are. She's a child murderer. Her music is to destroy the souls of as many people as she can. Can you talk briefly about Madame Blavatsky? Yeah, uh, Blavatsky, I, you know, the two most influential people as far as occultists on the world, of course, uh, one would be Crowley as far as culturally relevant, as far as impacting popular culture. But uh, less influential than Crowley on popular culture would be Madame Blavatsky, a, a Russian mystic who uh, was actually started the Theosophical Society, her occult society, in 1875, the same year Lester Crowley was born. However, while less influential as far as, you know, what was popular in, in, in modern culture today, she was more influential than Lester Crowley in politics. In fact, uh, the Theosophical Society has had more influence on the United Nations than any other religious society, whether you would call it Christian or occult society. Uh, now what's interesting about Blavatsky is uh, she did uh, emphasize Satan as being the true God and, and Satan beckoning Adam and Eve to partake of the fruit. She, she was really tr he was really turning them on to true Godhood and he's the one who really freed the human race in Blavatsky's teaching. Now later with Alice Bailey and other uh, of, of her uh, followers that became leaders later, they distanced themselves from using the term Satan but they still use the term Lucifer. In fact, she used the term Satan often and Lucifer and their magazine, uh, their publication, Lucifer, you know, uh, a magazine she had called Lucifer and a publishing arm called Lucifer Publishing was later changed to Lucis Publishing. Uh, and when you read Alice Bailey, who took over uh, for Blavatsky, she talks about this coming New World Order uh, under spiritual powers and Lucifer, Luciferian powers and so forth. Uh, it's no mistaking what it's about, where it's coming from, and it's all predicted in the Bible. But what's interesting is they, they talked more so than Crowley did about this coming New Age Christ, this coming uh, Christ that would rule the world. Much as the Bible says, Jesus said, I've come in my Father's name and you receive me not. If another one comes in his own name, him you will receive, speaking of the Antichrist. Well, uh, more so than Crowley, they've had a lot more to do with directly, specifically preparing the New Age movement for the New Age Christ. The dominant view in New Age eschatology, their end time view, is that there will be a Messiah that will unite the world and religions in the end times. We know that person is Antichrist according to the scripture. Now what's interesting is Blavatsky a Theosophy recognizes its roots as being Gnostic. And they call themselves the Neo-Gnostics, as do many New Agers. It just so happens, in the first three centuries of church history, the greatest threat to the Christian church was the Gnostics. They claimed to be the true Christians. And it was confusing in the first few centuries, unless you knew your Bible, because the Gnostics used the Bible too. And they mixed uh, together their Gnosticism with other occultic traditions and religions, and sometimes even Eastern religions, if there was a migration of many Gnostics that had come from the East. So you had this, this New Age kind of thing already happening in the first few centuries. Now John, almost all scholars admit that John is coming against Gnosticism in his first epistle. When he says, God is light and in him there is no darkness, because the New Agers or the Gnostics back then blended light and darkness as though there was... God was both, you know, good and evil, or uh, that nothing, there was no true separation from God from his creation and so forth. Now what's interesting about all this is John identified Gnosticism as the spirit of Antichrist. You look me in my eyes and you ask me this. How on earth can a holy and righteous God know what I did and thought and said on yesterday and not kill me in my sleep last night. You ask it that way and we can talk. But until you ask the question that way, you don't understand the issue.
Until you ask the question that way, you believe the problem is out there. Until you ask the question that way, you believe that there are somehow some individuals who in and of themselves deserve something other than the wrath of Almighty God. Until you ask me the question that way, until you flip the script and ask the question this way and say, why is it that we are here today? Why has he not consumed and devoured each and every one of us? Why, why, oh God, does your judgment and your wrath tarry? When you ask it that way, you understand the issue. When you ask it the other way, you believe in the supremacy of man. How dare God not employ his power on behalf of almighty man. You flip the question around, you believe in the supremacy of Christ. How dare I steal his heir? Because the last breath I took, I borrowed it from him. And I'm never gonna give it back. When you borrow something and never give it back, you're stealing. I mean, you need to take a moment and get right right now. <laughs> the problem is me. The problem is the fact that I do not acknowledge the supremacy of Christ in truth. The problem is I start with me as the measure of all things. The problem is I judge God based upon how well he carries out my agenda for the world. And I believe in the supremacy of me in truth. And as a result, I want a God who is omnipotent but not sovereign. If I have a God who is omnipotent but not sovereign, I can wield his power. But if my God is both omnipotent and sovereign, I am at his mercy. Well, thank you for watching this videotape. Uh, for those of you that joined us uh, by video, we want to let you know that you're welcome to give us a call and we'll try to answer any questions we can. We want to help strengthen your faith. On this tape, we talked about the age of the earth and what the Garden of Eden was like. Uh, it's interesting to learn things about dinosaurs and about creation and evolution, but it's much more important to know that you personally are going to heaven. If you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, or if you're not sure you're going to heaven, let me share with you very quickly and simply what the Bible says about how to go to heaven. You don't have to do what God says, but you at least ought to know what's going on and know what you need to do. When I was a sophomore in high school in East Peoria, Illinois, I had been raised in a variety of different churches, but I had never, I didn't know if I was going to heaven. I didn't know if I had ever trusted Christ. I wasn't saved. And a friend of mine asked me, he said, Kent, do you know if you're going to heaven? I said, no, I sure don't. He said, well, if I could take the Bible and show you what the Bible says, would you be interested in, in knowing? I said, yeah, I'd like to know about that. So he took his Bible and showed me three simple verses, and for the first time in my life, I understood what God wanted. The Bible says in the book of Romans, chapter 3, and verse number 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Everybody is a sinner. My friend looked at me and said, Kent, you are a sinner. You've done things that God doesn't like. I said, boy, you can say that again. And the Bible says everyone is a sinner. Now, some are worse than others in man's eyes, but in God's eyes, one sin makes you a sinner. And you're in trouble if you've committed, if you've broken one of God's laws, you're guilty, you're a sinner. Now, in Romans chapter 6, in verse number 23, it tells us, For the wages of sin is death. Of course, wages is something you earn. And wages of sin, what you have earned because of your sin is you have earned the death penalty. You deserve to die and go to hell. The problem is God doesn't want you to go to hell. So to be fair, God has to send everybody to hell because of one sin, but he decided to provide a way out. Jesus Christ came down and died on the cross to pay for your sins. And now you can accept what he did for you. So actually, his death pays for your sin. 
So my friend showed me the wages of sin is death. He said, can't you deserve to die and go to hell? I said, yeah, I know that. He said, but, the verse continues, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You do not get eternal life through the church. You don't get it through baptism. You don't get it through being good. You get eternal life through Jesus Christ. See, you received and I received, from, we received from our parents a free gift of physical life. Somebody else did the work, went through the pain, paid all the bills, and you and I got free gift, physical life. Getting born really only takes a few minutes. Now, growing takes a long time. And getting born into God's family only takes a few minutes. Growing in God's family takes a long time and requires a lot of effort, like reading your Bible, going to church, praying, doing those things. They help you grow to be a good Christian, but they don't make you a Christian. You only become a Christian if somebody else does the work for you. If Jesus Christ comes and lives in your heart and makes you a new person. February 9th, 1969, my friend said, Kent, you're a sinner. I said, yeah, I know that. He said, according to the Bible, you deserve to die and go to hell. I said, yes, sir, I know that too. He said, but God wants to give you a gift, eternal life. You deserve eternal death. God wants to give you eternal life. I said, well, how do I get it? He said, watch this. Romans chapter 10 and verse number 13 tells us, for, the way, for whosoever, whosoever means anybody, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It doesn't say you might be saved. It says you shall be saved. Anybody that receives Jesus Christ, they call on him. They ask him to forgive them. The Bible says in John chapter 1 that if you receive him, you become a child of God. You become a son of God. In John chapter 3, it says you must be born again. These things all tie together. When you receive Christ as your Savior, some people use the expression you receive him into your heart. When you receive Jesus Christ, when you accept what he has done for you, you become a child of God. You receive the new birth. It just takes a few minutes to say, Jesus, I'm a sinner. Would you please forgive me and save me? And so February 9th, 1969, I bowed my head and I said, Lord, I'm a sinner. I know you died for me on the cross. And I'd like you to forgive me. I'd like you to come live in my heart and save me and forgive me. Make a new person out of me, would you please, Lord? I just received Christ as my Savior. And so that day became my spiritual birthday into God's family. I'm now a child of God. have been for quite a while. And if I do something wrong, I cannot go to hell because I've received the gift of eternal life, and eternal life lasts forever. But as God's child, I can receive his punishment. See, I'm in God's family now, and it's treated very different, a family matter, if I do some sin. Whereas before, I would have been... A, God would have been my judge. It was a legal matter uh, if I had sinned. But now my sins are paid for. So when I tell people I'm going to heaven, it's not because I'm so good. It's because my sins are forgiven. You can have the same thing. If you'll accept Jesus Christ as your Savior right now, he'll forgive your sin and save you and take you to heaven. In this session, we talk about creation and evolution and dinosaurs and carbon dating and all those things that are interesting. But it's not going to matter if you go to hell. Please, check your heart. If you've not trusted Christ as your Savior, why don't you ask Him to save you right now? Just bow your head and pray a simple prayer like I prayed in 1969. You can, now there's no magic words. God knows what's in your heart. But if you'd like to receive Christ, why don't you pray something like this along with me? Just pray and say, Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I believe you died for me on the cross. And I'd like to ask you to forgive me. I now receive you as my Savior. In Jesus' name. Well, folks, uh, Romans 10, 13 says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you just receive Christ, you've got God's promise. You're going to heaven. And God's promises last forever. So if you've just done that, why don't you call or write or email me and let me know. My name and address will come up on the screen and you can get a hold of me and let me know. You just received Christ as your Savior and we can rejoice with you. Once you receive Christ, now that makes you born into God's family. That's just the beginning. Growing requires a lot of work. You're going to need to read your Bible, go to a good Bible-believing church, start telling others about Jesus, and there's all sorts of things. And I'll be glad to be a help if I can be. Thank you so much. We hope you enjoy this video series.